Well again everybody, this is Steve coming to you with another intro to writing video. This time it's about plot twists. Uh, plot twists for me are fun. Uh, plot twists are actually one of the most fun parts I think of any story, whether it's a movie or a book or a play or whatever it is. Plot twists are, are a lot of, t you know, are generally things that catch you off guard that you did not see coming. Uh, those are the best ones where you're just, you know, because you could have something that's so cliche and you can look at it, oh, that's where everything's going and I know how it's going to end and stuff. And then all of a sudden the, the author throws you under the bus, but in a good way. Uh, and plot twists are great ways to uh, to keep to keep people interested in your books, uh, and in my experience and my opinion, there you know plot twists aren't just like surprises within the book. Uh, cliffhangers are a plot twist because in you know in my opinion, it's you know the plot twist is there to grab somebody's attention and keep them reading, keep them interested, keep them engaged with the story. Well. Cliffhangers are a great way to do that. I do that with chapters. And I've, you know, and I laugh about this because it's actually a huge compliment. I've had people, you know, yell at me and say, darn you, you kept me, you know, say, you kept me up reading the whole night long. Just one more chapter. Just one more chapter. And I'm like, thank you. That was a, I appreciate the compliment. Because, uh, you know, like one of the, one of the things I've gotten really good at, and it, this takes practice, so don't, you know, don't be upset if you don't get this right away. This takes practice. Uh, some people will pick to pick it up pretty quickly, but some people will have to work at it, and that's fine. Uh, sometimes natural talent for doing that doesn't ultimately uh, result in the better quality story because experience is the best teacher, uh, and that goes even with plot twists. Uh, a good example of a plot twist that is a uh, crowd favorite for among my books again using mine as a as a surprise thing or as an example I should say uh, is with like orc perimeter during the battle of the orc perimeter there's all these different things like the the ripple in the shield oh crud we've got this invincible shield that now suddenly is this weak feeble thing that we got to you know that we got to deal with uh you're you know you come in and you're kind of surprised by the fact that the fleet can hold its own i mean it puts itself in a good position so it's able to hold its own against the superior fleet uh but then you got you know eventually that superior fleet starts to win out and earth fleet starts to really 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 uh essentially lose its shorts if you will and you know it looks like they're they're about to collapse and they're going to have to fall back to uh, Kuiper perimeter. They're going to have to abandon uh, Pluto Station. They might be able to pull pull, pull Pluto Station in uh, behind the shield and protect it. But if more than likely, they're just going to have to abandon the station and, and scuttle it and go back behind the Kuiper perimeter, which they thankfully don't have to do. Uh, but it looks. You know, it looks like things are hopeless for them. And that's usually a good time to introduce a plot twist. Because uh, you already see earlier in the book little hints towards somebody coming to save them, but it's a more a case of, is it going to be in time? Or is somebody even going to be able to come at all? Uh, the plot twist in that particular situation was, yeah, yeah. Cavalry is going to be able to get there in time, but the cavalry doesn't have to fly there from somewhere else because the cavalry is already parked there on the doorstep just waiting for the word to go ahead. <laughs> and it's kind of fun, too, because you get to watch how Sevik literally just, even though, you know, even though he's going up against the Varnock Black Fleet or what's left of it, because there's one whole armada that... Well, not one whole armada. Three quarters of one whole armada that gets wiped out, and then the other one's still fresh. They ain't been fighting. Uh, and that goes up against Sevix two armadas. Now, in a normal competition, you're gonna you're gonna be like, okay, yeah, these two are probably gonna duke it out. It's gonna be a battle of attrition, and when all said and done, the Black Fleet will get defeated. But but Sevix gonna take some serious casualties. Uh, 
He's probably going to lose at least one full armada of ships uh, or three quarters of an armada, and the other, the rest of his ships are going to be pretty well beat up and walking away bloodied and li licking their wounds and stuff. And no! Sevik walks in, drives a wedge down through the middle of the fleet, or the Black Fleet, kills uh, Mobaic. He kills Mobaic, and as soon as he kills Mobaic, <laughs> fight's over. That's it. Done. Very, very few casualties, very little loss, uh, and boom, inst you know, instant victory like that. And, you know, you might say, well, that's a lame way to do it. Well, if you, you know, I'm kind of giving you the, the kind of the light brush across the top. There's a lot more to that, but, uh, there are a lot of plot twists and stuff where, you know, like I'll lead, I'll lead character or I'll lead the, the reader down a, a pathway that you think this one thing is going to happen and this is how it's going to end and yeah this is predictable and then all of a sudden something entirely different happens and I have a hard time with that when it when it comes to you know, from my perspective I have a hard time keeping information from the reader as far as what's about to happen what is happening etc etc such that they can uh, you know when they get to that actual event that they will, uh, that they'll be able to survive. Will they be able to, you know, conquer, etc., like that? Uh, another example is Destiny's mission. On the way out, they get jumped by the uh, Tregarians, and the Tregarians are, you know, they, <laughs> it's hilarious because Sevik had already planned for this. He kind of knew this was coming, so he had ships in reserve. And he had them hidden so you couldn't see them. Because the other ships are all traveling without cloak, which is the requirement of of uh, the UGW. When you're in neutral space, you travel without cloak. Which, um, how many people actually obey that? Not many. But, you know, if you want to look good to everybody, you follow the rules. Especially when you're going out there and you're hated in the galaxy for no good reason. Uh, you follow the rules so you look like you're the good, upstanding citizen and everybody else is a scoundrel. Well... The Targaryens come up behind them, think you know, with a fleet that initially looks like it overpowers Sevik's fleet. Well, then Sevik brings in his extra guys. Well, then uh, can't remember the guy's name. Uh, he's the he's the first Arjan, the the head admiral of this armada that's that's uh, coming after Mike and his his guys. Because they figure if they can get rid of Mike and then get rid of the Chancellor, they weaken Earth and it'll be easier for them to wipe out Earth just like their master uh, Crassus wants him, or Crassius wants him too? Crassius? Crassus? I can't remember. It's the, it's the Roman general guy. Uh, I've got so many characters with similar names, I get them crossed up sometimes. But anyways. Uh... Yeah, they think, you know, they think, oh yeah, we've got enough, and then you've got, uh, you know, then Sevik brings more, and, and then uh, the other guy brings more, and it goes back and forth for a little bit until Sevik kind of runs out of troops, but then the Targaryens have more troops, and oh, shoot. Well, they initially, Sevik stops to face him to buy Mike some time, because he's like, you know, as long as Mike gets out of here okay and the Chancellor gets out of here okay, then I've done my job, even if I die fighting these guys. Because, uh, yeah, okay, they're humans, but he realizes that the fate of his people rests on what happens with soul. That's odd as that sounds. Uh, and you see Mike and his, you know, his fleet of ship, or ship, six ship killers. Uh, you know, they, they cloak... And their cloaking is really good, so the Targaryens don't really know what happened to them or where they went. They just know the ships were still continuing on course and suddenly cloaked, so they assume they're still on course towards their destination. The plot twist is that Mike turns around and helps Sevik, which he really shouldn't have. He should have kept going, but he turns around and helps Sevik. Well, then uh, the other guy, the, the Targaryen Admiral, realizes that, you know, as the fight's going along, he gets word that, hey, the ship killers are back here, dude. Earthfleet's back here. Ah, oh, shoot, we got tricks. So he turns around, heads back. As he's heading back, guess who shows up? The Varnock. And, of course, you know, any reader who'd read the first book is going to be like, 
Ah, oh, crap. Oh, well, they're all dead. Because, <laughs> you know, Varnock just showed up. Yep, well, just throw these, you know, just throw these guys to the trash because they're done. Uh, Mike's going to have to bail and Sevik's going to get wiped out and stuff. And the plot twist there was these Varnock were not bad guys, not like the other ones, not like Mobaic and some of the others. Uh, and you also find out as a bit of a plot twist that the uh, the Varnock have kind of been put in their place and they've been tempered from the fact that there is a kind of a civil war going on inside their borders. And of course, you know, they've got they got the uh, Gagvon on one side, they got the Yandians on the other. They don't care about conquering the Varnock or taking their space. They're happy to leave the Varnock be and to do their thing and whatever, as long as the Varnock agree to do their, you know, to do their thing and stay within their their borders and stuff like that. So they're having this little civil war between them. They got the they got the factions that's still kind of siding with uh, the Roman general, I, and then you have the side that realizes, hey, you're a bunch of idiots. We're creating a problem that this is going to risk the Varn or the the Varnock's future. You guys need to stop it. No, we're not going to. Yes, you are. Back and forth. So you got that thing as a little bit of a plot twist. Um. Dark Earth is another one. There's a bunch of plot twists in that one. Uh, that one, you know, that one, the first plot twist is the fact that they get taken over to a another dimension that is opposite of their current dimension, uh, where history played out in an entirely different way. Uh, another plot twist is like, uh, you know, they're over there and they find a way to resupply Pendleton's fleet and, you know, hopefully keep him going until they find a way to bring him home. Well, oops, the gateway device accidentally blows up, so now they're isolated and have no way to get to get resupplied or anything like that. So now what do they do? Uh, there's a couple other ones in that. Getting off of my books and going to other ones, Surprising plot twist, C.S. Lewis, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, you figure, you know, if you're a reader who's never read it before, your first thought is, oh, crud, Aslan's dead, the witch is going to win, uh, oh, whoa, you know, whoa, whoa is us, the characters are doomed, Narnia can't be saved. And then the next morning comes, and boom, Aslan's up, he's whole, he's healthy again, he's stronger than before, and he, he just absolutely just destroys the witch. Uh, Ender's Game. There's a bunch of smaller plot twists in there. The biggest one is when they're fighting the buggers and they're going through what looks like simulations and they're fighting and they're uh, engaging the the uh, they're engaging the buggers and it looks you know it, it looks like the same kind of games that they did when they were at the academy. It's not until they destroy the bugger homeworld that they realize, oh crap, this whole thing wasn't fake. It was real. We actually destroyed a life form, a sentient life form. Uh, we have doomed an entire race of aliens who honestly made a mistake in attacking Earth. And they were willing to apologize for that and make it right, but Earth was like, "No, we're going to destroy you because we need to protect ourselves and save, you know, save humanity and stuff." And you know, and they basically uh, they go and completely destroy, <coughs> you know, Earth completely destroys the buggers, and they use Ender to do it. And like I say, and it, it's at the end you're thinking, "Yay, he won!" And now let's go get the buggers, and you find out, no, wait, he actually went and got them. He got, you know, he took the enemy and destroyed him and destroyed all the queens. So, there, you know, there's there's a lot of different ones like that. Um, trying to think of another good one. Um. Okay, I kind of ran out of ideas. <laughs> this happens. This, and then, you know, if you're a writer, that's going to happen too. You're just every so often just going to draw blanks on stuff. Uh, it, 
I like to jo- jokingly say it's the hard drive, to, you know, running a running a seek test, trying to trying to go through all the files on the on the disk to try to find what you're looking for. Uh, given the amount of stuff that's been shoved into my brain over 51 years, there's a lot of stuff to go through in there. Um, oh, there's a good example that's that's not fantasy or sci-fi. Uh, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes has a lot of plot twists in it, especially the big reveals at the end, because you don't necessarily see that coming. You see a lot of things coming, you know, that are that are that are exposed as you go along, but you don't really put them all together until. Sherlock actually explains the situation and all of a sudden, oh, okay, you know, plot twist. It's, you know, basically it's an unexpected outcome. Uh, Agatha Christie, uh, she had in her various books, they, lots of different surprises. And, and one of my favorites with that was when it was something you, you know, when, it, when they, they would reveal who done it. And it was somebody you did not expect. Because, you know, I got to a point where I could pretty well pick out who the bad guy was by the end of the book. How they did it, I didn't necessarily know. Why they did it, I didn't necessarily... Or why they did it, I didn't necessarily know. But I usually knew who did it. But then there were some of those whodunits that it honestly caught me off guard. I'm like, I did not see that coming. That is a cool plot twist. You know, and that's, like I say, that's the best way to do it. And like I was saying with my books, uh, one of the things that people like about those is I will lead them down a particular path and it looks like it's going to be a predictable ending and, oh, yeah, they're going to go down here and this is how it's going to end and so on and so forth. Or there's no way they're getting out of this. Uh, They're all doomed. And, And then I will pull in the surprise. Uh, another good one that, that I did, and this one was kind of fun because I was afraid I was going to give this one away when you're reading the book, uh, is in Homeworld from uh, Earthlight Saga Book 3. You see, uh, was it Captain Wise? Uh, I think it might have been. Anyways, he's the guy that in Book book 2 was flying the skipjack. Uh No, it wasn't Captain Wise. It was uh, Captain Olm. That's who it was, Captain Olm. Uh, if I'm remembering my character correctly, which I might not be. If I say that, my super world is so big. and I, I mean, you even look at my wiki. I got 805 pages of information that was just notes, and that's not everything. That's just uh, the important parts. So you can forgive me for forgetting things like this. But... Uh, Ah, let me see chair. Anyways. Yeah, have the have the scary, creepy chair. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> no, in that one, one of the things you see is they're talking about ways to defeat the Predicator. And Captain's in there, and they're looking for ways that they can come against the Predicator because coaxial-powered vessels are vulnerable. They are getting anywhere near this ship is lethal to a coaxially-powered ship. Uh, this thing, this ship, the ship doesn't even need to try hard. It just hits you. And it creates such a powerful feedback loop through your power systems. Your ship just goes... <laughs> and there's 10 of the skipjacks that figure that out. So, you know, there goes 10 ships and, uh, and all their crews for Earth Fleet. They've got the space stations that get all shot the heck. Uh, you know, they're basically... You know, Earth Fleet's sitting there getting wrecked by this one ship that has this ability to uh, take the Achilles heel of coaxial technology and use it against Earth Fleet, which then takes Earth Fleet's strength and just makes it nothing. It's just it's just gone. It's just a little puff of smoke at that point. <coughs> the plot twist is that you still have at least two warp powered ships in Soul Space. The first you know, which also comes up in plot twist because the Predicator's coming in there, he's completely uncontested. He has absolutely no problem. They sent some fighters against him which were older fighters. They were not coaxially powered. They, were, they used little fusion reactors. So they weren't vulnerable to the, to the Predicator's weapons. Although, they, compared to the Predicator, they were not as strong. And the Predicator eventually shot them, you know, shot them up bad enough that they had to kamikaze into the, into the ship to do some extra damage to it. Uh, these were just old, you know, obsolete starfighters. 
and uh, you know that that's kind of the first thing that hey we've got something that might be a chance oh darn that didn't work you know then in comes the cave new now the cave new is a warp powered uh, Gafondo Na starship it belongs to Finch they run it they go in there and you know the the cave new does it you know for a diplomatic personal starship the the cave new does a pretty decent job against the uh, the predicator she gets shot up and has to limp out you know has to retreat and kind of limp away uh, you know say so she gets roughed up pretty good to the where that if they would have kept fighting they would have died so because you know the predicator even against a warp powered ship is not a pushover uh, that's a that's a pretty power or pretty strong ship even against warp powered vessels now the real big big uh, The really big uh, plot twist in here was uh, when the Spartacus showed up. Because the Spartacus is a dreadnought. It's an old warp powered dreadnought. And even though it was stripped down, not completely, it was they was they were still in the process of do, of uh, of uh, decommissioning it and demilitarizing it, making it ready for. Uh, display at the uh, Starship Museum. It was still capable of fighting because it still had one whole, you know, one whole side. Because basically they had gone through and they completely demilitarized the port side of the ship. Well, the starboard side of the ship was still intact. The internal parts of the ship had been gutted. She had basically just enough fusion power <coughs> and warp power to uh, make the jump from the shipyards to the. Uh, to the Starship Museum, and then she would have been put on shore power after that, and that would have been the end of it. She just would have been a museum piece. So she was still capable of fighting because she'd only been about half demilitarized. But even in, you know even half demilitarized, that was a heck of a ship. She just beat the snot out of the Predicator. Uh, and you know, thinking about that whole scene there too, uh, if you remember my previous video about uh, strengths and weaknesses, this is a great example of balancing strengths and weaknesses because you have you have like the predicator it's got this overpower overpower or overly powerful strength this you know overpowering strength that earthly can't stand against it there's nothing earthly has that can fight against it and all of a sudden oh we found something that can fight against the predicator but it's not strong enough to beat it it's still you know the predicator's still stronger well then in comes the cave new now the cave new is a lot stronger than the fighters were but even the cave new is too weak to take down the predicator beats it up a bit you know definitely gives it definitely ruffles its feathers quite a bit no pun intended uh, <laughs> but the predicator is a civilian starship well armed and capable but still a civilian starship going up against a ship that's a dedicated military vessel uh, she does pretty good but she gets you know heavily damaged and wounded and is forced to retreat uh, then you have the predicator which is a dreadnought and as I've mentioned in previous videos, the Spartacus, which was part of the Romano class, uh, that was the first Earthly starship that actually scared the Gay Vaughn because it was such a good ship. So now you've got an OP situation that you have to balance it. And the balancing part was the fact that it was partially decommissioned or partially demilitarized and it was it had limited fuel. So it was a it was a battle uh, it was a race against time to knock out the the predicator before the uh, before the predicator before the the Spartacus ran out of power. So uh, anyways, getting back to what I was saying though, those are those are great examples of plot twists. Uh, you know, you can plot twists can be, you know challenges of running up against time uh, challenges of running up against uh, obstacles for you know uh, like you know some plot twists that you could have is you know like say you send an, uh, you send uh, the king sends out his army or he sends out a band of elite warriors they go out and they find this goblin horde and they wipe out the goblin horde and yay we were victorious and they come back and everything everything's following pretty cliche 
and just as you'd expect it to and then they come back and as they're walking up the mountains and they cl the clear the last hill before they get to the uh, before they get back to the castle just as they clear that hilltop they see their castle and it's been razzed to the ground and there's dead dead human and, and orc bodies all over the place and all of a sudden these guys realize that if they would have stayed they could have defended the castle and driven off the orcs which means that they're them being drawn away to take out this orc village or this goblin village or whatever it was it was to get them out of the castle so that the rest of the go uh, the orc army or the goblin army or whatever it is could sack the castle and take it out that is a plot twist that's something you don't expect because there's no indication up to the point when they cross the hill or cross over the hill and see the castle is completely just destroyed that they realize that Oh crap! We were, you know, we were tricked. We were, you know, we were made to think uh, that this was the real enemy, but it wasn't. This was the distraction, and by us being taken away from here, the castle wasn't capable of defending itself, and and because of that, it fell. Uh, so that's act, you know, that's a, that right there. Like I say, is a great example of. You know how to do good plot twists in a story and make the story fun, enjoyable, exciting, thrilling. Uh, you can take otherwise uh, boring sections or sections that might be a little tedious and spice them up. At you know, add plot twists and stuff. And one of the things too with plot twists, don't just do them off the cuff. Plan them because everything up to that plot twist. Uh, is is necessary uh, preamble to make the plot twist work because like you know using the example I did with the with the with that one special unit of soldiers who went out to uh, take out the goblin village or the orc village or whatever it was and you know protect the kingdom but you know the plot twist was that was just to, to get them away from the castle so that the castle could be overcome you know yeah you didn't reveal that until later but you also, you know, you also didn't reveal the reason, the real reason why they were being sent out, which is they were being, you know, they were given a distraction that was a juicy enough target that it would draw them out. And once they were drawn out, then the castle was vulnerable and it could be taken out. But again, the, the reader doesn't know this until after the plot twist is revealed, but you have to set up everything before this, you know, and that, you know, the fact that the castle got sacked is the reason that they were drawn out because they you know the orcs set up uh, a diversion they were willing to sacrifice one of their units smaller unit uh, to get the desired end goal so anyways uh, I'm at 28 minutes uh, I think I've covered enough in this one if you need me to cover more uh, you know like it with any subject if you need me to cover more about it let me know and I'll do more videos and I can answer your questions. I can do Q&A. Uh, I don't have the ability to live stream, so I can't do a live Q&A. But I can do, uh, you know, I can do kind of like a recorded Q&A where you give me your questions and I can answer them, which is kind of part of what I'm doing here. Uh, but anyways, as always, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate your feedback, your comments, your questions. Uh, I'm, you know, like I say, I've been at this over 32 years, uh, at least full time. Uh, I was doing a little bit of dabbling in it before I, before I started it when I was 19. Uh, and when when I say 19, I'm not like talking early in my 19th year. It was more like close to closer to when I was 20. But anyways, uh. You know, like I say, I've 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 got 32 years of experience under my belt. I'm willing to teach you guys everything I've learned as much as I can, uh, as best I can. I'm not, you know, I'm not some uh, Orson Scott Card or Larry Niven or or you know, Asimov or anything like that. But you know, I still like to be the best I can for what I am, and that's what you should do. Don't, you know, don't don't be upset if you can't be as good as the quote-unquote literary greats be as good as you can be and if you can do that you've got you know you will be a successful author 
And with that, I leave you guys until next time.